my wife loves me. <laughs> and I was reminded of that this week. We had a toilet that was dripping in the tank. And I looked at her and said, I got this. You know, you know. And I think she knows too, but she just loves me, right? And so she's like, okay. So Monday night after dinner, went and I got the universal toilet repair kit, tore down the toilet, forgot I had a shop vac, so spilled water all over the floor, got that cleaned up. Some of the towels that we used to shower, didn't really mention that to her, just threw those in the, <laughs> the washing machine. Got all, the got all the water out, got the toilet broken down, put it all back together, put the toilet back on the tank, back on the bowl, I don't know, you, whatever that's called, put that tank thing back on the bowl thing, bolted it on, was feeling good about life. It's like, yeah, I, I, I feel good about what I've accomplished so far today. Awesome. Couldn't figure out how to reattach the, the water line that, that runs from the water line to the toilet because if you're a plumber, you know you install these metal pipes that aren't easy to, to, to reconnect to the toilet just so people have to call you. And so... I think I finally got it installed back, and I turned the water on, and water starts shooting out all over the place. And I said, hallelujah, Merry Christmas. And the boys are asleep, and it's, of course, the bathroom right next to their room. And I'm, you just, it, you're, you're entitled to a couple tool throws at that point. And so I threw two tools and was like, I got to go to Walmart, and then I asked Brooke, do I, do I look all right to go to Walmart? And she just looked at me and said, you have pants on, Brian. You look all right to go to Walmart. <laughs> That's just where I was, you know, mentally. And so I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm going to Walmart. I got, I got water on my pants. I don't match. I'm dirty, and I'm sweaty, and I... I'm walking through Walmart, and that's an education. And then I find the, then I found the the new water supply line that attaches so much easier. And so, I got that and and made it back from Walmart without any other incidents. And I'm like, that is a sign that the Lord is about to bless this. And so I attached. I attached the new water supply line to the water supply that's coming out of the wall into the toilet tank, and I turned on the water, and there were no more leaks. And I was like, yes, I've got this. The tank fills, and then I flush it, and water just starts gushing, <laughs> just starts gushing everywhere. And Brooke's like, stop it. And I'm like, there's no way to stop it at this point. Just let the damage happen. She's like, I don't think that's right. And I'm like, it's right. We could have thrown down the flapper. But, you know, at that point, I just wanted to see what we were dealing with. And there was water everywhere. And then I started pulling out the instructions that came with the universal repair kit. <laughs> oh, stop. Instructions. <laughs> like instructions with projects like this are never meant to be consulted. It's just a legal thing. Their lawyers make them throw them in there for legal purposes. So I'm reading, and I'm, I'm down here somewhere along these steps, and I'm like, yep, did that. Looks good. Everything's great. And then I notice there's this highlighted yellow note up here in the upper right-hand corner, which, again, nobody reads, nobody reads instructions to begin with, let alone highlighted instructions. That just tells you right there, this is for rule followers only, all right? Oh, the rest of us are like, we don't need that. That's just a disclaimer. Note, some Gerber toilets require an extra thick gasket. Please call 1-800-528-3553 to have one sent to you. If you need it sooner, they are available at most home improvement stores. Guess who has a Gerber toilet? <laughs> I never knew it for that night. I'm like, well, call an 800 number. They were closed. 
So Tuesday morning, first thing Tuesday morning, I hit up three different home improvement stores. I'm like, do you have any extra thick gaskets? They, who work there, know about as much about toilet gaskets as I know about toilet gaskets. Because they're like, well, here's the, here's the aisle they're in, sir. Like, that tells me nothing. Thank you very much. So I've got one in my hands at the second store I went to. I'm like, I think this is it. I think I'm going to be good. But after the night I had the night before of spending three hours on a toilet and having toilet water explode all over me, I wasn't going to pull the trigger on I think I'm going to be good. And so I asked somebody, and they're like, yeah, we don't know. I'm like, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Happy New Year. Great. And so after three stores and no gaskets that I had confidence in, I came into work with a broken toilet and a bathroom that I had locked so that nobody could go in and accidentally use the toilet because then that's a whole debacle of another kind that I would not be so happy about. You ever been there? <laughs> Most of you are like, no, Brian, we know how to fix a toilet. It's pretty easy. <laughs> so maybe it's not on a toilet repair, but maybe it's something else where it just seems like things aren't going your way. And it, what's really cruel is when you start to think things are starting to turn the corner. When you start to have some confidence, when you start to feel good about something, when you start to think, well, this, this is going to work out. There's all those other times in my life that I could look at and say, it, it wasn't going to work out that time, but this time, this time it's, it's going to work out. This time it's different. This time... It feels good. Maybe for some of you, you're there right now. And the cruelness of this time of year is that everything is designed around being happy and around being fun and around being jolly. And there is a magic to this season that is seen in children's faces and the joy that it brings about so many. And yet the other side of that coin is there is a cruelness to this season. So this morning, we're going to investigate that. We're in the middle of something called the chaos of Christmas. So if you've wondered why our stage de decorations have gotten so bad lately, that's why. Um, but, but we've talked about in the first week, we've talked about in the first week what we need to wear. And we saw how all of us have natural inclinations in our life of things that we need to fix. And they, they don't they aren't things that we even have to work on. We don't have to work on being miserable people. It just comes naturally to us. And so there are things in all of our lives that we need to improve and we need to fix. And then last week we saw that at the moment that we become followers of Jesus, the Spirit of God comes and lives within us, and He, he gives evidence in our life of of the fact that we've made the decision to follow Jesus. And so that our lives, after we make the decision to follow Jesus, should look differently. That we should be people of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And in a world that is devoid of so many of those things, the need for us to radiate those things becomes increasingly greater. This morning we're going to see how we can survive. Not just Christmas. Not just the chaotic aspects of this season, but how we can survive life. And so we're going to look at just three verses today, but a promise of Jesus from Matthew 11. So if you have your Bible apps on your phones or your tablets, you can follow along on our event. Otherwise, the verses will be on the screen as we dive into Matthew 11, and we start in verse 28, where we read these words spoken by Jesus, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. And the invitation that Jesus says right out, the, right out of the gate is this. Come to me. Come to me. 
We can, we can try to find so many different solutions to all of our problems, but the very first solution and the very first step to every problem that we face needs to be this response that we instinctively run to Jesus. Jesus says, this is where it starts, come to me, come to me. When your life is falling apart, go to Jesus. When you are faced with increasing uncertainty and things that you do not understand, go to Jesus. When it seems like there is no hope left for you, go to Jesus. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. So this idea of labor is those who are just tired from work. And, and you, if, if you work, you've undoubtedly experienced this. That you are just exhausted. It's just that huge project at work that is just zapping all of your energy and you just, you're just exhausted. You are just so tired and it seems like they never end. It's those days when you love your kids more than anything in the world and you are so thankful that you have the opportunity to stay home with them. But it's, it's, it's bedtime and it's 10 a.m. And you're like, we haven't, we haven't even hit lunch yet. And I'm already exhausted and I'm already tired and I'm already of telling you for the 376th time, do not put your hands on that thing. Thank you. You're just exhausted and you're tired. As you're out at the job site and you've given all that you have to give. You've still got three hours on the clock. That's this idea for those who labor. When you, when you feel that point of just breaking and you're exhausted and, you, and you've reached the end and you just, you just can't. You're just, your energy is zapped and you're just running on emotion and adrenaline. And Jesus says, for those of you who are tired, for those of you who are tired from work, come to me. And those of you who are heavy laden, that's for those who've been carrying a burden for a really long time. It's different than just the initial exhaustion that, that all of us face. This is when you've had the diagnosis. And there is no cure. And this is your new normal. And you carry this around day in and day out. This is when the divorce is final. And you're single again, and this has become the new normal. And this is what you carry day in and day out. This is when it's, it's gone way past the point of just fighting. And this is where you haven't spoken to your kids or you haven't spoken to your parents in years. And there's no hope restoration this is the burden that you carry and jesus says come to me all who labor and all who are heavy laden and i will give you rest this is the promise of relief this is the promise of relief that only jesus can deliver but understand where it starts it starts with us running to him and he says, for those of you who are just exhausted, for those of you who've been carrying the burden for so long, come to me and I will provide for you rest. And here's one of the problems that all of us face, is we don't know how to rest in our culture. We do not know how to rest in our culture. 70% of Americans do not get the rest that they need. 70% of Americans do not get the sleep that they need. That means 7 in 10 of us are running on adrenaline and caffeine. And you wonder why everybody's so irritable all the time. It's because people don't sleep. We have viewed sleep as, as a weakness in some ways. And it's, it's ridiculous. Our bodies and our, our faculties are designed by God and, and they're designed... They're designed in certain ways, and we need to take care of our bodies. They are temples. And one of the best ways that all the research shows us that we need to do this is by giving ourselves adequate amounts of rest. 
And so for some people, and I understand that there are, there are medical factors into this, and if that's the case, then go see a doctor. There's no shame in it. But for some people, you just need to psychologically accept the fact that it's okay for you to sleep. It's okay. Now, I hope my wife doesn't watch this because I make fun of her every time she takes a nap and watches the Gilmore Girls. But I'm just telling you, it's okay. It's okay for people to rest. It's okay for people to sleep. Your body needs sleep. That's one of the ways that God designed it. And so never feel bad about making sure that you're getting the rest that you need in your life. And give yourself that permission. Some people need seven hours a night. Some people need eight hours a night. Some people need nine hours a night. Your teenagers will try to convince you on weekends they need 16 hours a night. But the reality is, the reality is we all need, we all need rest. And everybody's body is different, but you need to make sure you're getting the rest that you need. Not only are Americans not getting enough sleep at night, but 72% of Americans who have paid vacation won't use all of their vacation. 72% of people who have paid vacation will not use all of their vacation. Listen, you need to take time away. You need to take time away. You need to clear your mind, and you don't need to apologize for that. Make sure you are incorporating aspects of getting enough rest into your life because when you operate with no margin in your life you become miserable when you operate with no margin in your life you become miserable and the way i can promise you that is because i've seen it in my own life and if you're like well that's just you brian ask somebody you love how you act when you don't have margin in your life if you do not have proper margin in your life you will become miserable And notice this. Notice this promise is made to the tired and the weary. That Jesus says, come to me, those of you who who are tired and you're weary, and I will give you rest. He doesn't say, come to me after after you've fixed it. Right? And that's the promise of Jesus. That we don't have to clean up our circumstances before we approach Jesus. And maybe you're here and you're like, there's so many things, God, I want to do for you, but I, I've got to get this figured out first. No, no, no. Jesus says, come to me exactly how you are, and I will be your solution. That's the promise that Jesus offers us. You don't clean up your circumstances before you encounter Jesus, and encounter with Jesus cleans up your circumstances. Never get that backwards. And then Jesus continues, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Now, for those of you who aren't well versed in what this concept and idea of a yoke is, a yoke was made of wood to fit around the neck and shoulders of an animal. And I I think we got a picture here that we can show up show up for you to to understand what this was. And it was part of a harness that was used to pull a cart and a plow. So in our in our context, for the, those of us who don't farm, in our context, it's, it's kind of like, not, not exactly like, but it's kind of like putting a, a collar on a dog. You attach the leash, and then you can, you, can direct, you can direct the animal. What it shows is it shows submission. It shows being under control. There's also this idea that, that would be used in the context of when Jesus was speaking of a student sitting under the feet of a professor, a student being under a professor. Come, come sit at my feet is what we would say in our day and age for somebody to take a yoke upon them and to learn from someone. And here's the reality. In life, we are better off learning and submitting to the ways of Jesus than trying it ourselves. Jesus says, you are tired and you are exhausted. Come to me. And when you come to me, I will give you rest. But part of that solution to you being tired and exhausted and part of you finding rest is you submitting to the way I'm telling you to do things. And what can be incredibly difficult is we want the benefit of a relationship with Jesus and we want the benefit of the rest that Jesus offers, but we don't want to submit. And that's not how it works. 
Jesus says, come to me, no matter where you are, no matter what your circumstances are, you come to me. I will give you rest. But then he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. If you want rest, if you want to be delivered, then you need to do things God's way. And Jesus says this, right after he says that you need to submit and you need to die to some of the things that you want to do and instead do things God's way. Then he offers this, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. Come submit to me, not that I can, not that I can use and abuse you. Come to me that I can give you rest. For my ways are gentle and lowly in heart. And and here we just are so reminded of this statement of the gentleness and humility of Jesus. That in the ultimate act of his humility as Philippians 2 just, just really pulls out for us. And if you have some time, go read that as it really just draws on how great the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf. That God himself would humble himself. And come and take on our likeness in our form. To be born as a baby. And to walk through life. All to be crucified for my mistakes and for your mistakes. That is the greatest act of humility that could ever possibly occur. And so when Jesus calls us to be gentle and humble, understand that he's not asking us to do anything that he was not willing to do. Yet, this idea and this concept of us humbling ourselves can seem incredibly foreign. Because when we humble ourselves, what it means is we serve others. We elevate others. And sometimes we're like, that's okay. But then there's other times where that's the last thing we want to do. Take my yoke upon you. Come sit at my feet. Come learn from me. I am gentle. I am lonely in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. The longing is gone and we will find life when we lay our life aside and realize that the greatest life we could possibly live, the most fulfilling life that we could possibly live is a life that is lived in obedience to Jesus. Without question. That is the most fulfilling life that we could possibly live. And then Jesus says this, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus offers a better way. He offers a better way. And it's not just the stress and anxiety of Christmas that can pull this into focus for us. Though it is one of the things that can help. The question that you have to ask yourself right now that nobody else can answer for you. Your loved ones probably know the answer. But nobody else can answer this question for you right now. The question that you have to ask yourself is, is your life one of peace? Does peace define your life? As followers of Jesus, peace should be one of the defining characteristics of our life, as we saw last week. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit. And in a chaotic environment in which we all live in this world, there are so many people who are so desperate for this idea of peace, and yet it eludes them. And the question is, does it elude you as a follower of Jesus? Is your life, is one of the hallmarks of your life, peace? Is peace prevalent in your life? 
And if the answer to that question is no, then there are things that are out of whack in your life that God does not, des- that God does not desire to be out of whack in your life. Does that mean that every, every situation in your life is going to be easy? No. Does it mean there's never going to be a hectic season in your life? Absolutely not. of stress and anxiety and worry are what define you. And your life is out of balance. And God never designed us to be people who operate that way. Are you exhausted? Are you tired? The surest path to exhaustion is trying to do everything by yourself. And what's so frustrating about that for so many of us is we're competent people. We're competent people. God's designed us to be really smart. God's designed us to have a lot of life experience. God's designed us with with cognitive abilities and everything else where we can really, really sit down and we can solve problems. And it feels great great to solve problems. What happens is we become dependent upon ourselves. And the reason that Jesus came was to restore a broken relationship with us, with our Creator, because we were never designed to be people who are isolated from our Creator and try to engage everything on our own. That's the paradox. That we have a good God who loves us and wants to be involved in every aspect of our story. And the more we try to write our story, the more we try to take over the narrative, the more we subtly push God outside of that, the less we depend upon Him. And what we do in those subtle moments when we push God away is we push peace away with. Then we find ourselves stressed, anxious, without margin. And rather than quickly go out and reach out to God, and rather than just run to Jesus, as Jesus says, come to me. We try to fix it ourselves. And that entire time, we just put push peace further and further away. So Christmas is one of those times where you're stressed because you have overbearing family that wants to do everything. Or you're stressed because you have no family. Where you're stressed because there's too many gatherings. Or you're stressed because you're all alone. And there are no gatherings. Where you're stressed because you have too many gifts to buy and you've bought too many gifts. Or you're stressed because you have no money to buy any gifts. And yeah, it's the most wonderful time of the year, but it's also the most stressful. Has peace invaded your life? After three stores, I called 1-800-528-3553. Because I wasn't any further along. And all I knew is I had a toilet that was shooting water all over the place. And that wouldn't be good for anybody. Three minutes later, they let me know the gasket was on its way. reached the point I had nowhere else to turn what was so stupid is the answer was right there all along 
And I wonder, are you finally there? There's nowhere else to turn. You don't know where else to go. And I want you to know Jesus is right there. And he's looking at you and he's saying, are you tired? Are you stressed? Are you exhausted? Are you fed up? Then come to me. And do it my way. And the good news is that when we do, he's not like your vindictive mother. Well, you should have listened to me the first time I told you to do it that way. If you'd have listened to me the first time you did it that way, we wouldn't have been in this situation now, would we have? Now, what have we learned from this experience? Mm. <laughs> no. He's saying, let's get you rest. For my way is easy. It's your choice. If you want peace, Jesus is the pathway. But he's not going to make you. That's up to you. God, I pray that we would be people who experience your peace. I pray, God, for the person who's here today who's exhausted. And they're just exhausted because they've been working really, really, really hard. And they've been accomplishing some really incredible things. But the margin in their life has disappeared. And now their life's a mess. And I pray, God, that they would discover your peace. I pray, God, for the person who's here who has a new normal. That life isn't going to look different. That relationship isn't going to be salvaged. And I pray, God, that as they've got that burden which is weighing them down, they would just fully hand it over to you. that we would be people who don't try to accomplish it on our own. But we hand it to you. That your peace would rule and reign in our hearts. And we would make our lives look more like yours. That we'd quit trying to do it our own way. And we would surrender and submit. Give us peace, we ask. And it's with hope that we pray to your son, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray.